Welcome everyone to my talk on Kant and the murderer at the door. Kant on the problem of lying. And this is a highly contested area in Kantian ethics. It will be quite a long talk and I don't claim to have solved the problem, but I do want to defend Kant or Kantian ethics against accusations of that he's a rather rigid um, moral thinker and doesn't allow for lying even in the worst situations. So the murder at the door is the famous passage from on the supposed right to lie from philanthropy, where Kant says that even when a friend's hiding at your place and the murderer comes to get him, even then you mustn't lie. Now, I'd like to defend Kant against a few positions here. Before I do so, I would encourage you to share the video, to leave a comment, to subscribe, and of course also if you can, to support the channel via Patreon, for example, or PayPal. So thank you very much, first of all. Let me begin. I will be reading. So even to the benevolent reader, Kant's position on lying, on lies primarily as presented in the supposed right to lie from philanthropy, but also, by the way, in paragraph 9 of On Lying zur Lüge in Metaphysics of Morals, Part 2, another work by Kant. Now, this often serves as proof of Kant's rigorism and the quixotic or even monstrous nature of his moral philosophy. Konrad Paul Liesmann, for example, argues that he's a philosopher in Vienna. Now, certainly, these passages no, and the brevity and the exaggerated formulations, but also misinterpretations, even by benevolent readers, have influenced this, what I would consider a misreading. To be precise, I argue that the misinterpretation springs from commentators' neglect to follow Kant's strict distinction between lying in the ethical and the juridical sense. So there are two senses, the ethical and the juridical sense of lying. And Kant is like that always. The trouble with Kantian philosophy is always that he analyzes everything, chops everything up, and that doesn't bring it back together. And also to some degree a false understanding of his terminology. Simply applying, as for example Korsgaard has done, the various formulations of the groundworks of metaphysics, um, to, of, of morals, the categorical imperative, to he's supposed to write to lie, to this essay on the murder at the door, that's misguided. That yields always confusing results at best. Because then this essay by Kant, this pamphlet almost, is seen as to morally demand from us to rather help a murderer than our friend. Then this contested text is also sometimes used to back up claims that Heidegger, uh, that Kant only gives us um, you know, very rigid moral rules. In the Metaphysics of Morals, in the part two, in the paragraph nine there, um, apparently when we lie, we are denied our humanity if we only lie once, if you read Kant very rigidly here. Now, in this talk, I will try to see the valuable lessons from Kant, but also the limits of Kant's moral philosophy in the case of lying. First, I will talk briefly about what it means that Kant considers a lie. That's very important, first of all, to, to understand that. And then I will consider the supposed right to lie, the murder at the door, and then my concluding remarks. Kant stands in the tradition of Augustine, Saint Augustine, who vehemently condemned lying. Alistair McIntyre, for example, has pointed this out. For Kant, lying is, quote, der faule Fleck, um, der Menschheit. It's the tainted stain on humanity. But it's also inevitably part for him, I think, of the conditio humana. St. Augustine's contra mendatium, against the lie, was concerned, or is concerned with the question, how it is possible to know the inner truth of the other. That is, how can I know that what you say in a truthful tone is in fact true 
to your best knowledge. Our inclination to condemn lying thus primarily originates from our ignorance about the inner truth of human beings. That is when we find out that what the other speaks is in conflict with her inner self. And of course, the sound of truthfulness is here. At heart, problem. Kant's psychological characterization of the sound of truthfulness in Perpetual Peace in Philosophy, there's another essay by Kant, intensifies but also thoroughly describes the problem of the human condition. Whenever we communicate, we hear the tone of truthfulness. That means we assume that the other speaks truthfully. Her voice, and this of course has to do with Logos, her voice of the other does not automatically tell us her inner truth, however. While Constant argues that the unconditioned prohibition of lying would make every society impossible, as Kant points out, Kant considers lying, and I'm quoting here from Ellen Wood, deception and duplicity, the systematic vices most characteristic of human nature in the civilized condition. Now Kant considers this as fundamentally harmful to society, whereas the person that Kant attacks in the only supposed right to life from philanthropy thinks that society needs lies at the heart of it. Kant does not want this to be the case. Now, it's very important that Kant is an anti-consequentialist. The consequences of the action do not matter. What matters is the inner, the, the in the true sense of the word, the ethos, the ethos, the ethos, in the Greek sense, innere haltung, the inner stance. That's what matters. And by the way, the categorical imperative is not empty. The categorical, the CI, the categorical imperative has as its content freedom. Be yourself, be free, be a free, willing subject. That's the content of the categorical imperative. Now, um, this is why, you know, if Kant is an anti-consequentialist, the, consequ the consequences of actions do not really matter. What matters is the inner stance. And hence, the prohibition of lying is without exceptions, also McIntyre points out. A lie can never be sanctioned, however good its consequence. But Kant dis distinguishes very strictly um, between right, recht, and ethics. And hence he treats the, pro the prohibition of lying from two different angles. You have the moralisch rechtlich, that's moral juridical. Moral is always the, ex the external view of one others. And better than the other. So the first angle is moral juridical. And the second is tugendethisch, ethical, virtual, virtuous, ethical. Lying thus means to break a duty of right, in the first sense, or a perfect duty to oneself, or both, in the second sense. Now, of course, many lies can violate both. And here's what Kant says. Every action is right if it can coexist with everyone's freedom according to a universal law, or if on its maxim, the freedom of choice of each can coexist with everyone's freedom in accordance with a universal law. Lies in the ethical sense. That was now lies in terms of the juridical sense and now the legal sense, and now lies in the ethical sense. They are based on the categorical imperative and its various formulations as we find them in the groundworks of the metaphysics of morality. But lie, lüge, is a strict technical term for Kant, which is clearly defined again by the moral, juridical, and the ethical. Thus, uh, some sort of a you could say, uh, un an untruth from politeness, as, as, as Kant puts it, an untruth from politeness, that's fine, or a notlüge, as he also says, a necessary lie, a lie that you know leaves you, let's use a, a white lie, I guess, is in the English word. Though those are, um, they're not really condemnable lies for Kant. Hmm? 
to, what, what Kant addresses in terms of flying is this is something with 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 Kant is so difficult is because one has to be very strict with the terminology he employs. Lie just doesn't mean lie in every single text. These are all distinct texts. And the trouble of the entire Kantian philosophy is that he doesn't bring it all together. I mean, that, that's literally a critical system, which isn't a system, but the critical philosophy ultimately cannot be completed. And he doesn't write the, the system that should, should have risen from the critical philosophy because here reason separates itself further and further from itself and never comes back to itself, to a synthesis of itself, because Kant doesn't see that anymore. Now, anyway, so a necessary lie, a white lie, an untruth from politeness, those are not really condemnable lies for Kant. Again, what's condemnable are the lies in terms of the juridical, moral, and the ethical sense. Now, only in situations where someone can demand a truthful declaration from me, I have to speak truthfully. This is what Kant says. Examples of such situations could be, for example, where my external freedom might be in jeopardy, or where the future of a relationship depends on the confession of one's secret. Think of marriage. Now, an untruth from politeness is not condemnable again, if it does not entail that I compliment you so as to politely deceive you into falling one of my ends. Um, if that if that's not entailed, so if I if I were to lie to someone out of mere politeness, oh, this looks quite nice. You look really nice. Maybe you don't. But if, but if if I don't make the other a means to my ends, then it is not condemnable. If, however, I do so, to not from politeness, but from an untruth from trying to deceive someone to make him or her my means to my end, then it's condemnable. Very important. One must not ever turn another human being into a mere means to some end. Now, the other, the Nordlüge, the white lie, the necessary lie, uh, is allowed in self-defense. And in defense of others, even, I would, I would think, with Kant. And in the following now, I would like to present more, the more rigid account of the lies in the juridical sense and the ethical sense. And I would like to raise a defense against the claim that Kant allows for mere misleading. I don't think he does. Now, in the case of the juridical moral lie, in which, by the way, this is very important, the supposed right, the proposed, supposed right, um, to lie from philanthropy, this text against Constant, this text is considered concerned only with moral juridical lies. Kant himself makes this explicit in a footnote, by the way, which you can find in the text, if you have a good copy of the text. Now, a Kantian lie is defined as an intentionally untruthful declaration, which means Aussage or Deklaration, with the purpose to deceive the other. If I make an untruthful declaration, I violate the duty of right. I lie in the sense that I impede someone else in her external freedom. Truthfulness, veracitas, veracitas perhaps, means that a person has to make a statement to her best subjective knowledge of the subject matter in question. Declaration. Also, the notion used in the supposed right to lie, one has to be very careful with Kantian terminology, is certainly a juridical term. Kant uses the term declaration, Aussage, Deklaration, within a legal framework. Because what Kant is worried about is that we found in this moment of Aufklärung, of the Enlightenment, a society based on lies. Primary examples for declarations are statements under oath before court, clauses in contracts, statements by or to a government state official, but also where my intention is to impede someone else's freedom by deception. And that means an invitation to a lethal, um, a lethal dinner, for example, as you can read in uh, Machiavelli. I make a declaration 
if 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 someone were to invite someone to a lethal dinner, someone would make a declaration saying, you know, you are invited to a dinner, but that's I'm about to break a duty of right. So then the speaker is liable by right, and of course to penalties and civil damages, etc. Yet not every wrong statement, even if intentionally wrong, is per se a juridical moral lie. If I tell you in small talk, in a misleading way, that I am a genius of finance, merely to impress you, which I'm not, while I actually know hardly anything about the industry or the work, it is not a lie in the moral juridical sense since I do not impair your external freedom. I rather make a fool of myself. But if you were to be my future employer as a bank, and I make that statement in a job interview, then it is a moral juridical lie in that sense for two reasons. First, you are in the position to demand a truthful declaration from me in this very, very situation. And second, I intentionally deceive you, use you, as a means in order to achieve my end, a well-paid job. And due to my inferior knowledge, I will probably hurt your company, which means to impede your external freedom. Thus, according to Kant, my lie, if universalized, would cause, quote from Kant, that declarations are not believed at all. And this is what Kant is concerned with in the supposed right to lie essay, the murder at the door essay. Very importantly. But does this mean that Kant does not forbid any form of misleading among friends at all? Now, there's a claim by some that, that lying is forbidden but not mere misleading, right? And let's think of a, an example, which is that Someone who wants to be a murderer, his name is Paul, he's, he's cooking a lethal dinner, as we just mentioned, the Machiavellian lethal dinner. Um, and the dinner is for a friend who he knows to have an allergy, and he uses some ingredient that will very likely kill his friend. And his friend, then, of course, the intention here is to kill. Now, there have been people who said that Khan is so rigid in his account of lying that he's so loose on the, or which is described as misleading, that he would allow for this kind of misleading, which would lead to murder. But it would can't really allow for lethal misleading. Would this not be falling under the notion of lie? I don't think so. I don't think that this is an example of mere um, misleading. I really don't. I think um, rather that um, there's something else at stake here. Now, to George's, uh, to Paul's best knowledge, so this is the, the example, Paul, Paul's the born with the lethal intentions. Uh, here, here's the misleading part. Let's make this example very uh, clearly. Um, if, if, you know, because it, it's, it's a case of splitting hairs a bit with Kant. Because if the, so if, if there's a, a nut allergy and there are no nuts per se, the nut itself in the meal, there's nut oil in the meal, then of course the friend could ask Paul, are there nuts in it? He would say no, and that would, be, that would not be wrong. But that is not just mere misleading, that is a lie. E even though because, yes, appro appropriately there are no nuts, but there's nut oil, which is a derivative of nuts. So here it's still not just a case of mere misleading or a white lie or again of um uh, or it's just a lie from politeness because here this is, this is what matters the inner stance not even the consequence matters the consequence of someone dying doesn't really matter for Kant that much what matters is the inner stance and the inner stance is i no, no, paul wants to kill his friend so and of course also, you know, the, the, Paul knows that Frida's external freedom cannot coexist with this intention. Hmm? And the very intention is his, 
to impede her external freedom. This is why he does not reply truthfully at all. So, Paul, in this example, intentionally violates the duty of right, and it's a proton pseudos to neglect in these examples that George's violation of such uh, is what's taking place, and also that George is lying also in, of course, in an ethical sense. His inner stance is, is corrupted. Now, the murder then here takes place by intentional untruthful deception and by the inner stance. Is there a higher form of violation of a duty of right? Yes, this is mm, um, this is exactly uh, what this is. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crude violation of a higher form of um, of a duty of right. But of course, then at the question again, just to bring this back again, it, this is now more in the legal, ju juridical sense, but isn't there also an ethical sense? Now, this is also a lie, of course, just to make it very clear, in an ethical sense, right? Um, it's because the ethos, the inner stance, is one of someone who wants to violate the rights of the other. Um, the, and it's, it's an intentional untruth, hmm? as, as Khan says, an, an, an intentional untruth. It's, it's always about the intention, the inner with the aim to deceive someone else, not just mislead, but utterly mis mis deceive, so that someone is used also again as a means to an end, but also is harmed, fundamentally harmed. Um, now, such a lie, an ethical lie, can be external or internal. And George's, Paul's lying begins with the preparation of the mealery, the prep with the inner willing to kill the to kill the uh, to kill his friend, and as, as Kant says in paragraph nine of the Metaphysics of Morals on lying, a person who he himself does not believe what he tells somebody else is of less value as if he only were a thing. Now, George knows that what his intention is, what he does not believe, and he implicitly answers Frida that the food is harmless, and. So what's used here in this weird example is a lie in the juridical, legal, but also in the ethical sense. And Kant, as a non-consequentialist ethical, uh, his non-consequentialist ethical and juridical prohibition of lying, that means that a lie is wrong even if no one is harmed, that's of great value precisely in cases such as this. Now, even if someone in this situation who suffers from such an allergy does not die, then the murderer, with his intent, would still be responsible of lying and, of course, was of the intent of murder. Only by his intention has he breached a duty of right and violated a perfect ethical duty to himself, and that means to humanity, too. Now, in the Perpetual Peace um, essay by Kant, we find the following important quote, which I would like to read out to you now in full. It is, is it, sorry, it is impossible that everything a person opines is true because he can err. But in everything that he says, he must be truthful. He shall not deceive. It may well be that his confession, bekentness, is either merely internal before God or also external. The violation of the duty of truthfulness is called lie. Now, in the case of this murderer, someone confesses wrongly internally, and he is not truthful when he wishes to kill his friend because he deceives. It is utterly absurd, as so many commentators have done, to claim that Kant excuses mere misleading that includes any harmful intention. This claim rests on the assumption that what is articulated truthfully must only appear truthful on the first level, but intention and the implicit content of statements play a role, the most important role. Deception must be understood as manipulating another person's conduct, i.e. making her a means of one's own end. A simple compliment is thus not a deception, as we said before. Now, perhaps, and I'm not a huge fan of this, but perhaps this helps. 
a possible reconstruction of Kantian lies negatively construed is as this. First, whenever a person makes a declaration confession, she has to speak truthfully. I have the perfect duty to remain truthful at all times. Thus, the declaration one makes has to be in accordance with one's inner knowledge on the subject matter and in accordance with one's intention. Declaration is to the to the other. What I or what anyone says forth, what anyone says can hence be truthful, but still wrong and vice versa. Yet this does not excuse any evil intentions one may have. It's about the inner stance. And before I turn to a proper analysis of the supposed right to lie from philanthropy, the murder at the door, there's another advantage I would like you to consider of Kant's account of lies in the context of advertisement. A company X advertises declares food product Y as healthy, although it contains several unhealthy ingredients. Even if no one is provably directly harmed by it, junk food is advertised to children, a non-consequentialist ethical theory recognizes the advertisement as both a lie in the juridical and the ethical sense. Now, despite the advantages, Kant's vehement condemnation of lying often provokes abhorrence still. Yet Kant radically attributed autonomy and reason to, as Schneewind puts it, every normal adult, and thus broke with prevailing views of the moral capacity of the of ordinary people, had good Kant had good motivation to do so. Reason, Vernunft, is the constituting character of a human being as a person equipped with dignity. But simply, Kant's definition of being a person is linked to reason expressing itself as reason. That's to say, there shall be no discrepancy between thought, internal, and declaration confession, external. Thus, if I lie, I use my reason as a means to deceive, and so I treat someone else as a tool. Someone else is treated as a tool. Someone else's reason is treated as a tool. Now, I'm moving on to the supposed right to lie. When we apply the categorical imperative to this text, I think that that's wrong. I think that's the wrong approach. And I think um, I would like to now, because this leads to thinking of Khan as a rigid moralist. The groundwork where we find the categorical imperative is concerned with the question, when, when is it that our actions have moral worth, content in the ethical sense? If I act, because SRL is, is crucially only concerned with lies in the juridical moral sense, not in the ethical sense. And the groundwork, I would argue, is concerned only with the ethics, categorical imperative. The content of the categorical imperative is the freedom of the subject. Um, if I act from duty and my actions are universalizable, they can be made universal, then in all simplification, they have moral worth, ethical worth. Thus, applying the categorical imperative to the supposed right to lying result, results in, um, in being truthful to the murderer is of higher moral ethical value than helping one's friend. If we apply the CI, the categorical imperative, to SRL, then what we end up with is, as a result, we think that Kant is telling us it's of a higher ethical value that to, to be truthful to the murderer rather than helping one's friend. Because only by remaining truthful, I obey the moral law. Consequently, the moral law is more important than a human being's life. That would be the other result if we did this. If this had been Kant's intention, then claims about the monstrosity of his moral theory I think would be perhaps justified. Yet only a neglect of the historical context and of Kant's definition of lying yields to this result. Hence, 
Christine Korsgaard, who's a Kahn scholar, and I think her rather benevolent but still quite analytical interpretation of the Kantian lies only increases the confusion because she, Korsgaard, applies the principle of morality to the supposed right to lie. Korsgaard additionally analyzes the passage, paragraph 9, the metaphysics of morals, within the same framework. Thus, she does not respect Kant's distinction between the juridical and the ethical sense of lying. Her analysis, then, of the supposed right to lie, I would think, is something that can be ignored because it is, well, maybe this is a bit harsh, but it's, the misunderstanding here is that you, you, with Kant, the difficulty is that you, you cannot simply pull out the, the form, first of all, you know, the categorical imperative is not to be applied. That, that's the first crucial mistake. This is just where you see where analytical philosophy or maybe even American philosophy, Anglo-American philosophy, or that method just goes wrong. The philosophy isn't useful. <laughs> this is not, so that you read the groundworks of the metaphysics of morals and, and walk away with it and say, oh, I'm now going to um, take this tool, the categorical imperative, the second formulation, and apply it to my everyday dealings. No, no it's a groundwork of thinking. It's in, it's, in, it's in thought that it happens. And what's happening here is exactly this kind of representational imagination with which Anglo-American political philosophy deals all the time. Everything's a thing. Everything's just, oh, let me just take this interesting thing from Heidegger and then build this interesting thing called the Heideggerian artificial intelligence. Or let's just take this interesting thing from Nietzsche and apply it to this other thing in Nietzsche. No, that, that's not thinking. Hmm? And this is exactly what... Korsgaard's essay here on the on lying and Kant exemplifies is she she takes the I mean just it's it's very maybe it's difficult to get this across but what what Kant is doing the groundworks of a metaphysics of morals is laying the groundworks of a metaphysics no one walks around saying oh I'm I'm reading Plato's Republic and I'm now applying the theory of forms which he doesn't lay out there anyways to the world. No, we're trying to think in principles. And this thinking comes before acting. And this thinking translates into acting, but it's not something that can just be blindly applied all over the place. Um, and, and it messes up uh, the entire project, but not just the, the project on lying, it messes up this entire way of thinking. is completely corrupted. It's, it's all turned upside down. <laughs> it's no longer thinking. Now the groundworks of, it, of Kant has become a toolbox to run around and, and apply. Oh, is this situation where the third formulation of the categorical imperative applies or rather the fourth one? I don't know. No, this is not what this is. Right? This is not philosophy. This is whatever this is. Uh, it, it, it's turning it, actually, weirdly enough, to stay with Khan into a means. Hmm? That's the interesting side, perhaps. Now, the title, I come back to the text and I'll be a bit more quiet. The title of SRL is on a supposed right and not on a supposed ethical duty to lie. On a supposed right. One has to be very careful here. So, this does not seem to strike Korsgaard as odd. Neither that it is entitled in German Streitschrift, a Streitschrift, a pamphlet. By its very intention, a short essay intended to provoke Streitschrift. It wants to start a fight, a battle of the minds, if you like. And it aims to attack Constant's understanding of Rechtsstaat, of also of the Bonum Commune, of what it means to found a state in the post-Enlightenment or during the Enlightenment era. Remember, for Constant, it would be fine to lie. Now, from her false premises, she forms her thesis, Korsgaard, that wants to defend Kant against the claim that, quote, she wants to defend Kant, that's nice, that our moral obligations leave us powerless in the face of evil. Now, to build her case, she quotes, suppose right to lie, and other um, passages, and in the letter, 
uh, which is in Metaphysics of Morals, uh, Kant describes the case of a servant who is instructed to lie to a visitor about the whereabouts of his master. The master, meanwhile, escapes and commits a crime. Korsgaard quotes Kant, Upon whom does the blame fall? To be sure, also upon the servant, who here violated a duty to himself by lying, the consequences of which will now be imputed to him by his own conscience. Korsgaard neglects that Kant actually writes, very importantly, upon whom does the blame fall under ethical principles. This is my translation now. And under, under ethical principles, she, she neglects what's in the bracket, conveniently, um, I think this is why the paper never got published, ultimately. But now there's YouTube and I can just uh, present it here to the world and someone will actually care for it, I think. I think. Now here, she neglects, perhaps intentionally, that there's something in brackets here. But on the ethical principles, the servant will have to deal with nothing but his own bad conscience, mit meinem schlechten Gewissen. Hmm? Not exactly a far-fetched claim by Kant, or is it, to say that you will have to deal with the ethical consequence of a terrible conscience when you actually defend your master as a servant, but then this master goes off to kill someone. I wouldn't think that's a too far-fetched claim. Now, and I don't think that actually this renders us powerless in the face of evil, as Korska claims with some pathos here. Rather, it shows Kant's egalitarian stand. Instead of remaining dependent on one's master, one should rather act from a perfect ethical duty to oneself that every rational agent can easily understand. That is not to lie, even though one was ordered to do so. Hence, one is rather powerful in the face of evil. The servant, as I think of the case, is most likely quite aware of the reason why his master commands him to lie. Thus the master uses the servant's reason as a mere means so as to be able to escape and follow through with his evil plan. If instead the servant chooses to use his own reason, he, under the ethical duty to himself, perfect ethical duty to himself, recognizes by power of his reason that it is wrong to lie. He is powerless only if he breaks the ethical duty to himself and disregards his own reason. Then he truly remains in a condition of self-incured minority, as Kant says. Nevertheless, Korsgaard's essay yields the mentioned crucial result that Kant condemns lying because lying depicts a corrupt corruption of one's own and others' reason. He's right in that regard, absolutely. Especially Korsgaard's analysis of deception under um, of deception, sorry, is crucial because she makes clear that, and this is a quote from Korsgaard, deception violates the condition of possible assent, and deception also makes it impossible for others to choose to contribute to our ends. So it's important then to see that that we have to appreciate you know, Kant's approval of lying in this sense. However, in the just mentioned example of the lying servant, Korsgaard again ignores that if the servant had not lied to a certain man, the alarmed police would have been able to prevent the master's crime. Thus, in the original example, which Kant... So this is very important, because this is what Kant thinks that Constant refers to. So Kant is this example of the servant who lies for the master in the Metaphysics of Morals. And Kant thinks that Constant refers to this, refers to a police officer at the door. That's very likely what Kant thought would have happened. That is, the potential murderer in SRL, is li in the supposed right from lie to lie, is likely a state official. Assu assuming it is a legitimate public authority. The discussion how the situation changes if an illegitimate state is assumed is beyond the scope of what I can hear say, but based on Constant's setup, Kant's underlying assumption is hence that the would-be murderer has a right to the truthful declaration. If this were not the case, then one could simply use a 
Notlüge, a, a lie, a necessary lie. Um, as Kant clearly and explicitly allows for. Everybody appearing at your door does not have a right to a truthful declaration. That's also very important. Kant says this truth from this is a quote from Kant. Truthfulness in statements that one cannot avoid is a human being's duty to everyone, however great the disadvantage to him or another that may result from it. Very important. The Kant very likely thinks that Constant refers to this example of his, about a state official. Um, and but to the state official, one mustn't um, lie. But, of course, the trouble is that Kant does not make it explicit, so this is, on my part, in the realm of speculation. And it, I cannot be corroborated. I cannot prove it. And uh, perhaps it's also fair to say that this, on my part, would be a way of um, trying to avoid the, the controversy, which I'm not trying to do. Um, I'm actually trying just to point out that we cannot simply apply the categorical imperative to this pamphlet. Now, still, it's not really satisfying. Yeah. What is, but what is the objective of the supposed right to lie? I think this is what's important. This is what's actually important. It's not to try to, to solve Kant, because there is no solution to, to Kant. It's not, it's not to um, whitewash him or sanitize him. Yeah, but I think there's, there's something here that's at stake for Kant, which is the following. As indicated above, Constant, and the, this is the gentleman that Kant responds to again, and is opposed to right to lie, are concerned with declarations that are truthful in the context of the political, but also with the limits of this duty. At the time their dispute took place between Kant and Constant, the Declaration of General Human Rights emerged. Kant quotes Constant here in this text. It is a duty to tell the truth. The notion of duty is inseparable from the notion of right. Where there are no rights, there are no duties. To tell the truth is thus a duty, but only to someone who has the right to truth. But no one is entitled to a truth that harms others. And besides the fact here that Constant turns the initial example about an ethical duty into a duty of right by claiming that, quote, the notion of duty is inseparable from the notion of right, which for Kant is not possible. Um, for Kant, there are several crucial issues with Constant's argument. Constant confuses truthfulness and truth. Kant replies that the single subject can never know objective truth. That means also all consequences cannot be known. Second, Constant's argument is consequentialist. He thinks to know every consequence. He thinks, he believes that the consequence of an action matters. That is, the potential murderer will certainly murder your friend because the murderer is incapable, your friend, sorry, I meant your friend is incapable of, is incapable of escaping. Interestingly, Kant himself untypically seems to be answering in a consequentialist manner. His example of your friend escaping while you had lied to the murderer about the whereabouts of your friend can lead to the murderer finding your friend. But Kant's example of the benevolent lie leading to a terrible disaster can thus not be used against Kant, but must be used to uh, must be understood as Kant's attempt to turn Constant's consequentialist argument on its head and against him. Constance assumes to know all consequences. Kant thus again in the provoking manner typically used in a Streitschrift finds one consequence that Constant had overlooked, had ignored. For Kant lying, especially in political contexts, is always per se a violation of a duty of right, precisely because one cannot ever know all possible outcomes false claims in court, international courts, for example, um, are a quite important example here. If an official lies to the public in international court about certain um, other states, for example, it could lead to rather horrible consequences. But for Khan, it wouldn't even be about the consequences. But again, it would be about violating the right, because that's ultimately what the entire 
system is predicated on is that the right, the law, is law, I'm sorry, the law is respectable. Now, the ends don't justify the means, to put it very simply. And on the third point, Constant claims that some individuals do not have a right to, truth, to truthfulness. This is very important. This is what Kant wants to argue against. Where does Constant draw the line, right? How does Constant determine the exception clause? Who is allowed to truthfulness and who, who is not? Kant thus rejects the claim that there are people who have no right to truthfulness. Admittedly, this is now Kantian exegesis on my part, but considering the mentioned formulation of human rights, Constant would readily exclude, it seems, some individuals from them. While Kant seems to want to emphasize that before court, for example, everyone has a right to a just trial. Der Rechtsstaat, the rule of law, is valid for all, even for those who break its laws. But the Rechtsstaat is impossible if someone excluded from its jurisdiction and have no right to truthfulness. For the Rechtsstaat to not be undermined, it is now important that the duty not to lie must be valid for all and every declaration. And it doesn't matter to whom it is owed. It doesn't matter to whom it is owed. Everyone is owed a truthful declaration. Everyone has a right to that. Now note in this respect that Kant includes from philanthropy in the title of this contested Streitschrift, this contested essay of his, where he says this is to indicate that emotional ethics easily lead to conclusions as Constant had drawn. Again, I think that Kant here wants to indicate that emotional ethics easily lead to conclusions such as Constant had drawn, which would exclude some and others not. We must not be led by emotions, according to Kant, but by reason. So, because the question is, does a murderer have dignity still? And as some may know, the first clause of the German Grundgesetz is that the Würde des Menschen ist unantastbar. Dignity of the human being is not touchable. And the murderer, for Constant, loses all dignity, even just the, without, with, weirdly enough, for Constant, who is a consequentialist thinker, the deed has not yet been done, but here the inner stands for Constant is more important, right? Um, Kant's main worry, I think, is ultimately in the essay that the Rechtsquelle, that the source of the law is harmed. That's, I think, what he's ultimately fighting against with this rather rigid account. Yes, it's not about saving a murderer in favor of uh, saving a murderer against a friend, right? And, and no, um, it's it's actually it's more about really the law and, and what kind of legal framework we want to set up. Now, in Kant thinks that the source of the law is harmed if lies in the form of exception clauses to making truthful declarations are allowed. So, there is a reason to assume that all actions of every person that are done according to duties of rights are part of this Rechtsquelle, of this source of law. We, the, the, the subject, is the source of law, the subject and its reason. Neglecting, then, the provoking character, the, the, sorry, the provocative character, of uh, the, the, the supposed right to lie and Kant's premise that the murderer has a right to a truthful declaration, the result is that, according to R, the murderer, by his intention to impede your friend's external freedom to live unharmed, destroys the source of law before you can lie to him, regardless of the consequences. In addition, one could ask, even with respect to Kant's premise of the murderer's right, to a truthful declaration, whether Khan can claim that my replying truthfully to the murderer, who by his intention has already violated a duty of right, who is about to break the law, does not make me 
as the respondent a co-perpetrator, a co-responsible in the murder. Although this sounds like a consequentialist example, I think the question is this. Does not my replying truthfully destroy the source of law in the sense that this very action cannot coexist with everyone's freedom? And how far, then, is it justified to call this an inconsistency in Kantian philosophy? On the one hand, lying in the sense of the legal sense as the basic principle of right. On the one hand, with the basic principle of right, prohibits actions that impede others' freedoms. And on the other hand, the universal law to remain truthful even to murderers can be an action that cannot coexist with everyone's freedom. And this is where, again, the tension is in Kant's system, or in Kant's philosophy. The trouble is, in general, with Kant that he's so analytical, so dissolving, that's what analytical means, that he cannot bring it back together. And this is why these attempts by analytical philosophers like Korsgaard are ironic, because they're trying to bring something back together and solve something that, that by its very nature cannot be solved, and on top of it cannot be solved within just the philosophy, but also cannot be solved with the method of analytical philosophy, which means to dissolve further, or by simply applying. So I think what what Kant's reply in this contested essay would have been if he had dealt with it also in the ethical sense, that remains speculation. In the legal sense, that's what we've just heard, what he said. But I've now raised a lot more questions and problems than I can hope to answer here or anywhere. But I do hope that some aspects of Kantian moral philosophy and ethics now appear less monstrous by this interpretation. Kant's vehement condemnation of lying in this very strict sense of the juridical and ethical and especially in the ethical sense, by the way, where he denies dignity to everyone who lies intentionally, who says his inner stance is a liar. Those should be understood perhaps as well-meant warnings because, as Schneeman put it, in moral matters we are all equally failures, but we all have essentially the same ability to get things right. What is essential is individual moral improvement, and this is what Kant is ultimately about and arguing for that there can be and must be individual ethical improvement. And the first step is to remain truthful to oneself and thus to respect the self I am. Simon Critchley notes with reference to Kant the following. If I act, and this is an infinitely demanding by Simon Critchley, if I act in such a way that I know to be evil, then I am acting in a manner destructive of the self that I am or that I have chosen to be. By remaining truthful primarily to ourselves, we avoid inner lies. We don't corrupt our ethos, because those inner lies easily become lies to the other. By first remaining truthful to myself, I can believe in and thus trust myself. I gain the self-respect to trust others. And in this trust, lies, of course, also the foundation for a healthy state, a healthy policy. Not in trustlessness, as people now say, but in trust, and not in lying, as Constant seemed to be allowing for. So I have not solved the problem, I apologize, but I hope to have given you some thoughts to ponder and Think through for yourself and read up for yourself. And most importantly, I think what can be learned from this is that philosophy is not something you apply. You don't run around with a toolbox filled with philosophical tools. Thinking is something else, and perhaps we'll get to a better understanding of what thinking is and how it occurs and what it is that we need to do in thinking so that we actually act and the, the deed that the deeds that follow from thinking translate from a sound and healthy thinking because thinking has consequences thank you very much indeed and 
thank you also for supporting and sharing uh, the channel. Keep well.